from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when people say, well, you know, it's not really real for today, I say, well, you know, you're talking to the wrong person on that because I've been touched too many times and there's too many people that have really been healed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Any others tonight? Marvin? Pastor Martin, I was reading today where it said that Satan has been bound by his That's right. Talking about sickness, I wasn't sick, but I was sick in sin. I was in my seventh year in prison in a cell, mm-hmm. and God saved me like He did you there yep. in Dallas. Yeah, turned my life completely around, and people came to my those that served God in prison would come to my cell because there was always a meeting going on in my cell. <laughs> We had church. Praise God. And you know, when I left there, I knew that that's what I wanted to continue to do, is to serve God and thank Him that He saved me from that terrible disease that I had, which was that sin. So not only does He heal our body, He heals our whole being. Yes, He does. You are made whole. Spirit, soul, body. Bless the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. To the Lamb. You know, as I look around, you, I, I can look at people in here and the miracles, the miracle of, of just being born again and see how God literally turned people's lives around that was really headed for the ditch, so to speak, uh, not to even be productive in this world, but how God turned them around and gave them a brand new start in life and now been so productive in the kingdom of God and, and productive just as a, as a as as a human being, hallelujah to the Lamb. And we thank God. That, that's the type of God that we serve. One thing that I learned was that I, I learned that you certainly have to be reborn right. from the beginning. Yeah. Because there were those others in prison that tried to do it on their own, and they always went back. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Don't work. Rehabilitation just don't work. Start fresh with a brand new spirit. Brand new whole person. Yep. Amen. Amen. Your spirit born again. Praise the Lord forevermore. Hallelujah. Anybody else before we get going, Tony? Um, I was wrestling in college, and I got hit pretty hard in the head, and I had a concussion from it. And I went to the doctor. He said something didn't look right with my stature. And um, I had an x-ray done from about the time I was 12 to 13. Mm-hmm. And um, they said I had something wrong with my stature. And so he said, you know, don't move wrong. Don't turn wrong when you're sleeping. You can slip and cut your, your cords and paralyze. Wow. And uh, so I was into my wrestling career, but Amen. You better believe it. Praise God. Boy, that's awesome in itself. Just to, especially when you know when you when they can look at it on X rays and different things like that. And just an awesome, awesome God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But we thank God because I'm going someplace with this testimony. That's why I say, can Jesus, is Jesus a healer? Uh, can he heal today? And can he heal us? You know, a lot of times we can pray for other people and have all the faith in the world to pray for them and see them get healed. But a lot of times when it comes to us, you know, we get doubting and this and that. You know why? Because we know ourselves. Lord, I failed you in this area. I failed you in that area. I failed you in this area. Will you forget about the failures? And put your, put your mind and thoughts upon Jesus, hallelujah, to the Lamb. Praise God forevermore. You see, God wants to heal every one of us in the name of the Lord, whether spiritual or whether physical, in the name of Jesus. Now I want us to get, into, uh, get, get some faith tonight here in Mark 8, 22 through 26. I know we're, not, we're just going to get started in this. We won't get finished with it. But Mark records some astounding miracles of healings. And why do you suppose they're in the Bible? Why do you suppose these, these, these miracles of healings are in the Bible? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hallelujah. He wants to admonish us to build our faith. That's why they're here in the word of God. Everything in this Bible is for our admonishing and for examples for you 
and for me. Bless the Lord forevermore. So if he healed along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, you know, back 2,000 years ago, he sure, certainly heals today in the name of the Lord. It, it all boils down to we really believe, you know, and, and uh, that's the whole key. And there's all different types of reasons why people don't get healed and people do get healed. Bless the Lord. And we don't have time to go into that, but uh, there's, uh, the main thing is, is you've got to believe that he's a healer today and he wants to touch you as well in the name of the Lord. But I want us to look at something here in Mark 8.22. Mark 8.22. It says this. Read it together. Let's read it together. Mark 8.22. And he cometh to Bethesda. I like that. And he cometh. You know, there's a message right there. And he cometh. Bless the Lord. And he cometh to Bethesda. And they bring a blind man unto him. And besought him to t- Touch him. Here we see some friends. I don't know, uh, you know, it had to be some friends that loved this guy and, and was concerned with this guy. And knowing that Jesus was in Bethesda, uh, you know, they grabbed a hold of him and, and took him over to Bethesda, wherever, you know, wherever this man was from. He wasn't, he wasn't a citizen of Bethesda, but uh, he, they took him to Jesus and wanted Jesus to touch him. Look what he does in the 23rd verse. Let's read it. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Now, this is Jesus talking. He took the blind man, led him out of the town. Now, let's read on. And when he had spit on his eyes (laughs) and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw anything. Wow. Here he is. He's spitting on another guy's eyes. Remember back in... in in Mark 7, I believe it was, he spit on a guy's tongue. He touched his tongue with spittle. And the man had an impediment of speech. And, and uh, when he touched him, that, uh, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't hear. He was dumb. And uh, when he touched the string of his tongue, when his tongue was loosed, when he touched him with his spittle. And I don't know, I've last, uh, last uh, study on that, uh, I've said something about, why would Jesus spit on something or make a clay of spittle and anoint a man's eyes or spit here in this guy's eyes or spit on his finger and touch a guy's tongue? That sounds grotesque to me. I, you know, I don't know about you, but uh, Jesus don't do anything just to be doing it. And there's all different types of answers, you know, uh, uh, theories why he did this and, and and I come up with a theory, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I do know one thing. How many moms have ever your own, took your own spittle when one of your kids had a dirt mark on the side of his face and go and wipe it off or on his head or wherever? Come on, moms, dads. Anybody ever do that? <laughs> How disgusting. <laughs> But they, they did to clean, clean the kid off. What didn't have no uh, towels available or whatever, so they just took a thumb. Uh, how many's ever kissed a child that was ha- had spit all over his mouth? Josiah's like that. He, he's all the time wanting to kiss Grandpa. Give me a kiss, Grandpa, and I'm going. <laughs> then when he gives me a kiss, you know, I mean, it's just slobbering on foot, and I guess here, <laughs> wipe he loves me though bless the lord hallelujah but uh how many's ever been in a sound sleep and you wake up in the morning and your pillow's wet with spittle <laughs> i always call it slobber <laughs> but you know you're so sound that uh, that you lost all your your muscle control in your mouth and and you woke up in the side of your pillow was just soaking wet with with spittle. <laughs> Bless the Lord. But under the Old Testament, think of this: under the Old Testament, when somebody spit on you, it mean that they cursed you. You know, I don't like to be spit on, and I don't like to see kids spitting on other kids. Anybody ever see that? Boy, it's just something that raises up on the back of my head. I, I was in Walmart and I seen a kid spit on his mom, and I thought, oh my Lord. I just had to turn my back and walk away. I'm serious. I, that's 
uh, you know, because there's just something in me, I don't know, wanted to uh, uh, smack the kid, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I guess I was brought up in old school that, you know, you, you honored your moms and dads when they said something and to spit. I, I, can't, I couldn't even imagine spitting on my mom or spitting on my dad without suffering the consequences. <laughs> Believe me, I mean, it was, <laughs> there, there was a lot of fear there, I'm telling you. Bless the Lord. But could it mean something, I'm, now, now, you know, don't, please don't take this for doctrine, but could it mean some type of symbolism that Jesus was putting forth here, that Christ came to, to uh, break the curse? And uh, to break the curse of, of, of uh, you know, I said that when you spit on somebody, it was, back in the Old Testament, it was a curse. And to spit, you know, whether he spit, you know, into the guy's eye like that or, or had his hands or whatever, I don't really know, I don't really say. But uh, to do that, could it be symbol, symbolizing that Satan was cursing, or I'm sorry, Jesus was cursing Satan and the blindness because that was in the curse? You know, that makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, it's just something that... I, a theory that I come up with because I was trying to come up with all different types of things, went to all different types of commentaries, and there's nobody really had a set, you know, doctrine in it and all different types of theories. But I thought, man, you know, that could really be something to think about. Bless the Lord forevermore. But anyhow, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not making that a doctrine, and please don't go out of here and spit in people's eyes, Okay. <laughs> Bless the Lord, you're liable to get knocked on your can if you do something like that. Bless the Lord. But uh, anyhow, as we look at this, it says this in 21st uh, verse. Jesus asked the man, do you see anything? After he had spit in his eyes, he asked the man, he said, do you, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Notice uh, it wasn't an instantaneous healing. I mean, even after Jesus demonstrated this, he asked him, he said, do you see anything? And understand, the man was blind, but now he is seeing, but he's not seeing plain. Okay, he said, I'm, he said, I'm seeing trees, but, you know, they're looking like men walking. <laughs> How many know that, that he didn't have 20-20 vision? So what happens, uh, you know, Jesus grabs a hold of him and prays again. You know, some people would say, you know, that really wasn't necessary, you know, uh, to pray for somebody two times in a row like that. That would lack faith. Can I tell you something? A person that says such a thing, they need to be shot on the forehead with a stupid sticker. Ask and keep on asking. Pray and keep on praying in the name of the Lord Jesus until the desired results come in the name, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And Jesus, we see Jesus once again putting his hands on him a second time. And after he puts his hands on him again, his eyes are opened up and he is restored and he can see men clearly, perfectly. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And how many know that Jesus don't leave an individual just half-heartedly healed? Or he don't leave a person half-saved? You're fully saved, spirit, soul, and body in the name of Jesus. Matter of fact, Paul said, I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise the Lord forevermore. Hallelujah. But when Christ does a job, he don't do it just half-heartedly. Hear me. And I've seen some uh, healers or whatever, you know, televangelists and what have you and pray for people and and different things, and say, well, you know, he'll be healed down along the line, or, or what have you. And, folk, I want to tell you something. Hear me. When Christ touches somebody, you don't touch them half-heartedly. Hallelujah. They're instantly healed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. And I believe we're going to see those miracles around these altars in Jesus' name. I certainly believe we'll see people come in with wheelchairs, hear me, that have been in wheelchairs for years. 
and not been able to walk, but God would bring them totally and completely out of those wheelchairs. And, ma- and a man won't even have to lay hands on them. But the Spirit of God would be so strong in the house, the glory of God, that they just rise up and walk in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Astounding healings. We've seen little inklings here or there. Phyllis said, talked about cancer being healed. We've seen several be healed of cancer and we thank God for that in the name of the Lord I've been healed many times and you've been healed many times and God's going to escalate that it's going to be in greater ways and greater measures in the name of the Lord Jesus now understand me I'm not I'm, I'm not proclaiming that well you know we're seeking after a sign those signs are going to come because we're believing in the name of Jesus you see they're just they're, God's just validating his word by stretching forth his hand to save and heal deliver and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And somebody said, Amen. Bless the Lord. Now look what he says here. Mark eight twenty six, And he sent, read it with me. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in the town. Very interesting. Stop and think of this a second. This man's blind. I'm, you know, he, how long he'd been blind, I don't know, you know. Evidently, you know, he wasn't born blind, otherwise he wouldn't know what a tree looked like. Amen? Because he said, I see men like trees walking. But uh, he wasn't born blind, so he had to have some type of vision, but something caused him to, to go blind. I don't know what it was, and it, the Bible don't say, but the, the end result was that, you know, he was seeing perfectly. Bless the Lord. But we need to ask our question, why would he tell him not to go into the town or go in and tell it to all the townspeople? Why in the world? Lord, would he do such a thing, such a miracle to take place? Well, I believe Matthew eleven twenty one through 24 answers that question. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Listen to what Matthew eleven twenty one through 24 gives the answer. If you would, please, bless God, read it with me. Woe unto you, Chorazin. Woe unto you, Bethesda. That word woe means impeding judgment. Say that with me. Impeding judgment. Judgment's coming to you. That's what he's saying. Woe unto you, Chorazin. Woe unto you, Bethesda. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Understand, Christ did most of his work in these cities. Most of his astounding miracles had taken place in these cities. But yet they never repented. Think of this. They wouldn't accept him as the Messiah. They'd accept him as a prophet or a healer, but not the Messiah. Hear me. Hallelujah. He said they repented uh, long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, look at this, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. Now, Capernaum, understand me, Jesus did a lot of miracles in Capernaum. Think of this. Hallelujah. And Capernaum, uh, it it was one of the wealthiest, wealthiest cities around at that time. I mean, it imported and exported uh, goods, and it was was just a boom town, so to speak. But but, uh, the Lord says this, and you, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, Matter of fact, they was exalted, you know, they was exalting themselves and saying, look what we've got, man. Look how, how much wealth we've got in this town, what have you. And he said, that shall, which art exalted unto heaven shall be brought down to hell. I want you to keep that in your mind for just a second. For if the mighty works which have been done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom... For the land of Sodom in the day of judgment, then for you. Why did Jesus want this man to go, didn't want this man to go back into the town, hear me, of Bethesda? Why didn't he want him to go back into that town, nor say anything to the people of that town? And the answer lies in this, woe. Woe to you, Bethesda. They wouldn't accept the Lord. They wouldn't repent of their deeds, hear me child of God so judgment was pronounced upon Bethesda and the Lord said I don't want you even going in there just talking to them anymore to show them 
what mighty works that I've done because they wouldn't accept it anyhow. He'd done many works in Bethesda, hear me. And they wouldn't believe him, wouldn't accept him. And understand something, folk. Hear me. When the Lord pronounced judgment upon a city or upon a town or upon a nation, it's going to come lest there be repentance. Now understand, hallelujah, God knows the heart of every city. He knows the heart of every person. Hear me. Hallelujah. And he knows whether they repent or whether they won't repent. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. But understand something. He knew that these wouldn't repent and they wouldn't accept him as Messiah. And he said, woe unto you in the day of judgment. You you know, and uh, Capernaum, you're going to be brought down to, to hell itself. Why? Because they shoved God away. They pushed the Lord away. Look at Luke eleven forty eight a second here. When you, I mean, you know, when you reject God, the only thing that's left is is what, judgment. It's the only thing left. Luke eleven forty eight. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. Stop and think of this. They've seen a lot of things. Hear me. And much was required of them. But understand me, they never repented. Never repented. Folk. Can people be like that? You better believe they can. Look at this uh, once in Matthew ten fourteen. Matthew ten fourteen says, And whosoever shall not receive you, this, Jesus taught, remember when he sent his disciples out, hallelujah, to heal the sick, uh, uh, cause the lame to walk, and, and cast out devils. And he said, Whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, Shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the, le- for the, uh, the land, uh, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Whole cities can reject Christ. And, and it said it'd be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah, which tells me there's different degrees of judgments that will, will take place at the great white throne judgment. I don't know about you, but I thank God I'm not going to stand at that judgment. Right. Amen. And somebody said amen. amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I've, I've got a commentary note on that. It says, shaking the dust from one's feet was related to the Jewish custom of cleansing the feet after traveling abroad. Soil from foreign lands was regarded as unclean. Upon returning to their homeland, Jews were uh, uh, obligated to shake the dust from the feet to symbolize the purity of Israel. Think of that. For the disciples to shake off the dust from under their feet would be a symbolic action declaring that whoever had heard the proclamation of the kingdom of God and spurned it had become like the pagan who did not regard the law of God. Think of that. Isn't that a sorry state, listen, child of God, that that a nation can turn its back upon God? And God dust his feet off? Could it be that, how long could it be for the Lord to dust the feet off towards America? When daily we're we're bringing out laws to cast God completely out of this nation, to turn our backs upon God? Could it be that we have a haughty look, a high look? Could it be that we don't want to anymore retain God in our knowledge because we are gods in ourself? Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. Lest there's no repentance in this nation. Hear me. It's going down the tubes. Some would say, uh, now, come on, Pastor Martin. Listen, I love this nation. I served my, in the military service, understand me, during, during the Vietnam era. I love this nation. I still get goosebumps when they sing the Star Spangled Banner. I still stand at attention and hear me when, when the flag is raised. Bless God, I still take my hat off. Hallelujah. I love this nation. But I don't want, love what this nation is doing. 
and the laws that are making this uh, that they are making in this nation that literally go that that literally go against the law of the living God. And folk, I want to tell you, if there is no repentance, and I believe the church holds the key to this, there's got to be repentance in the house of God before there can be repentance in the White House. Somebody say amen. amen. I believe the church holds that key to that. Bless the Lord. And I see, I, I see light at the end of the tunnel. I see that, that there is a, a nucleus of people that want God more than anything in their lives. And somebody said amen to that. Praise the Lord forevermore. But understand, listen, the Lord didn't want, them to go, want this man to go back into Bethesda because he pronounced judgment on it and said, that's it. You know, I, there's not going to be another miracle in Bethesda. That's why he took him outside of Bethesda. He took him out, led him out of Bethesda, and then done the miracle for him because he said, woe unto Bethesda. Hear me. Impeding judgment's coming in your direction. And can I tell you something? Woe to America because impeding judgment is coming lest there be a turnaround in this nation. Right. Somebody say amen. amen. Now you, uh, someone say, well, how do you know that? My Lord, just read the Bible. Don't, you, you don't have to be a prophet. If you really truly believe the Bible, look at Israel. We, you know, we're symbolic to, to, to Israel. Understand me. Hallelujah. And how God dealt with the Israelites when they would turn their back on God. And brother, I'm telling you, and sisters, we're following right down the very same route as what they did. And, and there's, there's all different types of wake-up calls that the Lord's trying to wake this nation up. And I believe it started with 9-11. I seriously do. And uh, judgments hit then. And judgments will hit again. It's hitting our economy. Some would say, ah, oh, never come on, blah, 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 blah. Well, you believe what you want to believe. But I know there's a God in heaven that's keeping books. And when you, turn, when you kick God out of your country, which this country was founded upon, when you kick God out of your country, God will turn that nation into hell. I didn't say that, but the Word of God said that. Hear me. I pray to God that there's intercessors that stand in the gap to make up the hedge that God would turn his fury from. Listen impeding judgment that this nation would come back to God we trust. And somebody said, Amen and Amen. Praise the Lord forevermore. How many has ever talked to people before? Hear me. You've talked to people and you knew you was like talking to a wall if you was going to talk to them about salvation. They didn't want, you know, they had nothing to do with it. All they wanted to do was argue with you. And, and, and there's been several times that I just dust my foot off and walk away from them. Just walk away from him. One time in, when I worked a secular job, I was talking to a guy trying to lead him to the Lord, and this other guy come up, and he had a little bit of religion. And he said, I suppose this guy's trying to get you born again. And I knew it was the devil. Knew it was the devil. And he sat and listened to some of the things that I was talking about and what have you, you know, and he was making a mockery of this and mockery of that. And it was just distracting is what it was, of what I was talking to this guy trying to tell him about Jesus and, and what have you, because I've already talked to this guy, and this guy said, zilch, he didn't want nothing to do with God. All he wanted to do is argue about God. And there's some things you just got to walk away with. Amen? You got to walk away with, because there's, there's a hundred more people down along, along the line that, that, will, that want, want uh, Jesus. They want a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and you ain't got time to play around with the devil. And somebody said, amen. Praise the Lord forevermore. But understand something, hear me. Bless God, we're coming into a, into a, a I believe, into a, an area where uh, it's vitally important that, that the church catch on fire for God to where it ignites this nation. What's the answer to abortion? The answer to abortion is the church be revived and go about the Father's business and get these people saved. If you get them saved, there's not going to be an abortion clinic. What's the answer shutting down the bars? Get them saved, people won't start drinking anymore. Can that happen? It has happened. It has happened in, in some of the revivals that have taken place. Whole bars have shut down. What's the answer? Hear me. What's the answer to homosexuality? Get them saved. Get, the, get them turned around. Praise the Lord forevermore. And the only thing that can do that is revival. 
Somebody say amen. It's got to be a revival. Praise the Lord. And if the church, listen, how, and, and that's not to, to associate, or I'm sorry, not associate, that, that's not to, to uh, say, well, well, you know, I've never talked to a homosexual. I'll never do this. I'll never do that. I will. I'll talk to them. I'll fellowship with them. I won't be, you know, I won't party with them or what have you, but I'll tell them, uh, you know, about the Lord Jesus Christ, that God can change their life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If they don't, who's going to tell them? Somebody's got to tell them. Somebody's got to stand up for righteousness. Am I right? Somebody's got to tell, you know, uh, the truth, bless the Lord, and not say, well, you know, God's love covers it. Well, the book covers it. Hallelujah. And God hates it. God hates sin. Bless the Lord. Can't go no further. Bless God. I'm getting, taking you over time. But we thank the Lord, hear me, child of God, for what he's doing in this church. I know what, you know, uh, what he's got in store for this church. We thank God, hallelujah, for the open doors that lay before this church and for the reviving that's going on in our spirits in the name of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I love the refreshing. How many love the refreshing? Can you give the Lord one more hand clap of praise tonight? Bless the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Stand your feet with me if you would please. We're going to let you go. Praise God. Hallelujah. Enoch, close us in prayer. Would you, brother? Thank you again, Lord, for the great service we have. Thank you for your word, teaching, Lord, the word that is our life. Lord, that would feed our spirits and stir us, Lord, and build and strengthen our faith. Father, we thank you for the move of your Holy Spirit upon us each and every time, Lord, that will stir hearts and lives, Lord, that so we might walk closer and closer to you each and every time, Lord. I pray as the week goes on, Lord, you bless each and every one, minister to their needs, Lord, until we meet here at the next time, Lord. We just ask you to keep your safety upon us.